I'm really honored and delighted to be joined today by several uh, colleagues who provide HIV care in New York City in, in different ways. I think everyone's kind of coming together onto the, the panel here as we, as we set this up, which is terrific. So thank you and welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce each of you and then we're going to we're going to um, talk about some some questions and let you describe a bit what you do as well together as well. But first, thanks so much for taking this time to join us on on World AIDS Day. It's really a privilege and um, I'm I I always like thinking about uh, especially the ways in which for those of us who do work caring for patients with HIV or do research related to patients with HIV and advocating for, for people living with HIV more broadly, how much we share in common, whether we are in New York City in, or, or in Kenya or elsewhere in the world as well. So I'm delighted to have some time to do that today. So. Um, our guests here um, for this discussion are Dr. John Stever, Dr. Roberto Posada, and Dr. Joseph Massey. I'm going to introduce all three of you, and then we'll get a, a chance to, to talk together as well. Um, so first, Dr. John Stever is the Director of Special Programs at the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. Dr. Stever oversees the Project IMPACT, which stands for Improving Access to Care and Treatment, which is the Adolescent Health Center's program to provide comprehensive treatment, support, and care for young people who are living with HIV, as well as HIV prevention services within Mount Sinai's um, incredible, really gold standard for adolescents. Adolescent healthcare provision. Dr. Siever graduated from the George Washington University Medical School in Washington, D.C., um, where training in internship, residency, and a fellowship in pediatrics and adolescent medicine was, was it, or actually, I'm sorry, he did all of his training work at the Children's Hospital uh, uh, in Los Angeles. And he really uh, focuses specifically on providing medical services to youth that are at um, somewhat higher risk, including youth who are um, living with HIV, youth who are affected by HIV, as well as LGBTQ youth um, here in New York City. Dr. Stever has been a real pioneer in providing puberty suppression and cross-gender hormones to youth within the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center um, here in New York. And I, I think throughout your work, Dr. Stever, it really um, speaks to your, your mission to provide high quality health care to underserved youth, um, regardless of, of what particular vulnerabilities and challenges they might be having. So we'll hear from you in a minute, but thank you so much for, for joining us today. We also have Dr. Roberto Posada with us. Dr. Posada is an associate professor in the divisions of infectious diseases and medical education. Um, and uh, within the Department of Pediatrics at the ICANN School of Medicine here at Mount Sinai as well. Uh, he's originally from Columbia, where he attended medical school, and he did his training in pediatrics and pediatric infectious diseases at the Montefiore Hospital at the Albert Einstein College of, of Medicine before joining the faculty here at Mount Sinai. Since 2001, Dr. Posada has been the director of the Pediatric and Young Adult HIV program at Mount Sinai's Jack Martin Fund Clinic, which provides comprehensive primary and specialty care for people living with HIV or at risk of acquiring HIV, and so um, also provides a great deal of care through the, the Jack Martin Fund Clinic for children and adolescents who are living with HIV. So, and I should note as well, also engages with with us in our global partnership in, in Kenya as well. And then um, also joining us uh, today is Dr. Joe Massey, who is also a physician and an educator, also has an author, uh, authorship titles among uh, his list. Dr. Massey is based in Elmhurst um, in New York City. He's a professor of medicine and a professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Public Health, as well as a professor of global health with the Department of Global Health um, and at the Arnhold Institute for Global Health at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, as well as serving as the director and chair of the Department of Medicine at the Elmhurst Hospital Center, uh, which is run by the New York City Health and Hospitals Group, where he's been the chair of the Department of Global Health at Elmhurst 
um, since 2017. Dr. Massey, though the uh, lone adult physician among us, but we'll forgive him for that today, has also provided uh, care for people who are living with HIV um, as well as other infectious diseases, specifically TB, um, and research and written books around things like Ebola, pandemic preparedness, bioterrorism, um, and has, has done a lot of work focused on um, exactly the kinds of issues related to pandemics, to to bioterrorist threats, to disaster preparedness that, that are so immersing um, us today as well. And Dr. Massey, along with uh, Dr. Sheila Maru, who is another faculty member in the Department of Global Health at Mount Sinai, co-lead together a partnership that's focused on research related to COVID-19 that's currently taking place within Elmhurst Hospital and, and Queens Hospital, bringing together Mount Sinai and the Elmhurst Hospital hospital and Queens Hospital groups. So it's really my delight to have all three of you together today as we kind of shift gears again and, and think a bit uh, more about New York City. Now we know that there are, of course, over 125,000 people living with HIV here in New York City. We still continue to have new cases of HIV here in New York as well. I think our estimate for um, a year is a, about uh, 740 new cases between in adolescents between the ages of 13 and, and young adults up to, to 29 in New York City. So HIV, of course, remains a growing problem um, in New York as well. And well, you know, Dr. Stever and Dr. Basada really focus on adolescents within this pandemic. Dr. Massey has been involved with adult treatment. I wanted to give each of you a chance to share whatever you would kind of like to, to give us a sense of the, the patients that you take care of, kind of who your patients are, their ages, their backgrounds, or who they've been. And along with that, as you kind of think about the group of patients that you're caring for in New York or that you're you You've typically been seeing how COVID-19 is exacerbating their challenges, making things uh, more difficult for them right now, if it is, of course, um, as well. So let me turn it over to you, maybe Dr. Siever, if you'd be willing to, to start us off today, that would be terrific. Sure. Um, so, I, you know, I think my um, program, the patients that I see, really does mimic a lot of the New York uh, demographics. So um, most of the um, kids uh, in my program are um, uh, of minority backgrounds, um, you know, brown and, and black communities. Uh, most of them are uh, men who have sex with men uh, or and transgender. Um, uh, and so it, it mostly mimics the kind of the, the population that the Department of Health has said is, is most effective. Um, many of these kids are of lower socioeconomic status. So we rely very heavily on, um, you know, some of the grants like ADAP and things like that to provide care for them. So this is not, you know, a uh, super wealthy, wealthy group. And so um, absolutely, I think, um, you know, I think you're going to get into some more of this later. I mean, there are issues around um, structural racism, and um, you know, there are just some built-in barriers uh, that many of these kids have, and many of it is often multidimensional. So, you know, they're of color, they're a sexual minority, many of them are trans, and so, you know, or, the, or they may come from backgrounds that are not accepting of some of those identities. So. Um, many of these kids really um, uh, have lots of needs, and uh, we try to provide a real comprehensive um, model for them uh, with social workers on site, nutritionists, health educators, nursing, doctors, the whole nine yards. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, I think the last part of your question was about COVID, and, and COVID is, has really thrown us a loop. Um, I think for some kids who are pretty healthy, um, many of them will use it as a way to sort of ignore their diagnosis, their illness. And um, I was kind of struck by the video with talking about Peter, how he didn't really believe his stuff. And I think that still happens uh, here in, in the United States. People don't necessarily believe their diagnosis. 
Um, and so I know some of my kids will use the COVID um, pandemic as an excuse not to come in at all, um, which has been a real challenge um, and uh, trying to find a balance between, you know, you need to come in to be seen, to have your labs done, to monitor things um, and check in versus a safety issue about riding the bus, riding the train and things like that. So um, I think the, the, uh, the, the pandemic has, has definitely thrown a loop into this. And um, I, I know some of our kids who had been so good at being mm -hmm. adherent to meds when they lose that little bit of, of assistance um, that we provide in the clinic, that I, I think that that has slipped for some of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I, I, you know, I think that is just as you're saying, such a, a global challenge right now as we as we can consider like that part of things is really you know really seeing that play out, you know, around the world in terms of if we try to provide care for kids who are living with HIV and youth and adults in that way. Yeah. Dr. Posada, do you you could you describe for us your patient population a bit um, and, and also perhaps how, how you're seeing um, them right now as well? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Rachel, for the invitation to be part of this panel. It's really an honor to have the opportunity to commemorate World AIDS Day uh, in this special way. Uh, the population that we serve at the Jack Ryan Clinic of the Montana Hospital in many ways is similar to what Dr. Stever described. It's a majority minority population of uh, people of color, uh, mostly uh, African Americans, uh, some black people from Africa, as well as Hispanic patients would be the majority of the patients. We do see a combination of patients in our, in our clinic. Some are people uh, that have been infected from mother to infant transmission. Now that has become, fortunately in this country, has become a very rare occurrence. So mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of very young children that have heard HIV from the mothers, but do we, do we still have a cohort of adolescents and young adults that were infected uh, from uh, their mothers. Um, in addition to adults that have gotten infected later in life, mostly through sexual contact. Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes LGBTQ people. Um, it includes also a number of young women who are unaware of their diagnosis mm -hmm. and become pregnant. And as part of their routine and in adult care, they get tested for HIV. Uh, and following uh, their delivery, they we, we see them for the management of the HIV and the management of the infant. Uh, we see not only uh, children and adolescents and young adults that are infected with HIV, but also uh, families, um, uh, the children of women who have HIV. Many of those women are our patients or the patients of our colleagues in adult medicine. We share the same space. Mm -hmm. So to make it easier for the families, we provide the primary care for those uh, children. Um, and we see also youth who are at risk for acquiring HIV and provide uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis services for, for those patients as well. Um, and the COVID epidemic really has made our work that much harder. Um, you know, as Dr. Stever was mentioning, uh, patients um, in our clinic really struggle to make ends meet. And this has made things even more difficult. Um, a significant portion of our patients, either that patients or their families lost their source of income during the COVID pandemic. Um, so that has been difficult. Um, are, and, and it's harder for them uh, to, to be able to reach, um, you know, to access medical care. Uh, with the epidemic, there was a lot of reconfiguration of health services in New York City. So for a while, the clinics were closed. Um, and now that they're reopening, it's been difficult to get people back into, into the clinic. Sure. Thank you. And thank you. So, thank you for joining and, and for sharing about that as well. Dr. Massey, perhaps you could describe a bit um, more broadly even the, the population of, of people living with, with HIV that are served in the kind of Elmhurst Hospital 
group as well as some of the other, perhaps some of the other work you've done related to, to HIV care. And, and of course, I'd, I'd love to really hear too about, um, from your perspective about the, the COVID impact for, for the community as well. So I'll turn it to you. Thanks for inviting me, Rachel. Uh, and thanks to uh, Dr. Posada, Dr. Stever. It's, um, you know, we started our program about um, 35 years ago at Elmhurst, and we're currently following about 1,600 patients. And uh, it's a very uh, reasonably stable population. About 95% of them are fully suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. Um, thank God we're in New York, so we have access uh, through ADAP to all antiretroviral drugs. Um, the patient population has been gradually getting older, and that's a good sign uh, because of long-term survival. It's been gradually fit shifting from men uh, to women. It's about 55-45 now, and it started out with um, many years ago with uh, maybe 50% injection drug users. That's now dropped a lot, and most of the patients, the male patients, are men who have sex with men, and the female patients are primarily female partners of men who had sex uh, with men or men who had contracted it elsewhere. So it, it's kind of a um, selected experience that we have in our clinic. And uh, when it comes to COVID, because this clinic population is uh, obviously medically pretty motivated, um, they've expressed a lot of concern about COVID too. Um, the community that we serve is uh, quite ethnically diverse a lot of crowded living conditions. And for all of those reasons, there's been great concern about COVID. And uh, as um, you know, Roberto was saying, I think uh, we saw a um, big impact on our clinic services as clinics had to be closed. We're trying now through um, televisits to a large extent, but an increasing number of personal visits mm -hmm. to regain the clinic uh, the way it was. And luckily because most of our patients were fully suppressed, um, there wasn't quite the urgency to get everybody physically back into clinic. But over the last couple of months, particularly during COVID, we've seen uh, a surprising number of people come into the hospital, particularly men who were HIV infected, who came here from other parts of the country to get services. And often they were uh, in very advanced stages of HIV infection. Mm -hmm. So that is coloring our uh, mm -hmm. clinic population somewhat again now. I think going forward with COVID, um, we, as you said, Rachel, <clears throat> there hasn't been much to suggest that HIV has a negative or a positive impact on COVID infection. Uh, although the inflammatory markers that are so pronounced in COVID infection, um, we like to see those very, very modest in HIV infection because um, high level inflammatory markers have been associated with long-term progression with HIV. But that theoretical problem aside, we're looking forward to being able to offer outpatient treatment for COVID as the um, antibody cocktails become increasingly available. And again, our clinic population is kind of unique, even compared to the medical primary care clinic here. It is a quite stable and dedicated population. But as you said, there are a lot of unidentified, undiagnosed HIV patients in New York, and that's particularly true in this community. So our outreach efforts to um, partners and uh, to offer HIV testing in uh, various places in the hospital and in the community remain really important. Uh, the, uh, you may know that we have had projects in Ethiopia and in Russia, and particularly in Ethiopia where the HIV medication supply has been tremendously impacted. We've seen a bad situation go to much worse as um, medications are not available and substitutions are made without guidance with uh, sensitivity testing or viral load, et cetera. So we're very worried about what's headed for Ethiopia at this point now with the, um, the instability there as well. Yeah. So HIV, is, you know, it seems like every year on World AIDS Day, we talk about some victories, but a lot of nervousness mm -hmm. in terms of COVID and Africa and HIV. Africa as a continent has a younger population. Therefore, they have a disproportionate amount of HIV, um, but they also therefore have a disproportionately low amount so far of COVID. 
if that were to change and COVID were to become more widespread in Africa, it really has devastating implications. Uh, and I don't know that we have much of a plan for any of that yet um, on a global front. Thanks, Dr. Massey. That's a, a really helpful overview that way as well. So one of one of the things with this panel, you know, we really do want to honor the stories of people living with HIV today as as best we can. And I know that you cannot, as physicians, share specific information about about your patients. But I did wonder and wanted to open up this space if there were any parts of stories or kind of versions of stories. Um, of a patient perhaps that, that you think of or that's special to you uh, that you'd like to share as we're honoring World AIDS Day. And I'm, I'm happy to just kind of open it up and see if any of you wanna, wanna jump in with a story. Sure. Um, I can tell a story. There's, there's many stories really, but uh, there's one that comes to mind because it's, uh, it's a current story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the story of a patient of mine or I should say a former patient of mine uh, because she has graduated now to adult medicine. Uh, but this is a woman that was born um, in uh, Central America and came with her father and her, th her three siblings to the United States in the late 90s um, after her mom had died in, in Central America. And it was when they arrived in New York City, one of the three girls was sick and was hospitalized at Mount Sinai. And it was at that time that the diagnosis of HIV was made in the three sisters. And when it was realized that the mom probably died of complications of HIV. Uh, so this was in the late nineties when medications, uh, the first medication that truly made an impact in the outcome of HIV became available. And um, this patient and her two sisters were treated with them uh, over the last 20 years with the usual struggles of treating children and adolescents and struggling with adherence and viral loads that were not always suppressed. Um, and, but now eventually um, in the last five years, she became much better with her medications and she has been undetectable consistently for many years. And she just delivered a baby boy uh, this last week. Oh. Um, so it's a positive, a positive story that I wanted to to highlight. Uh, it was a lot of hard work and struggle at up and downs along the way, um, but I think we're in a good place right now with with her. That's that's so terrific to to hear, and I, I feel like that's a perfect. Um, I don't I don't know if you were able to join us in the beginning, Roberto, but I, I feel like that's a perfect counterpoint to the story I shared initially of. Um, of a little girl whose birthday should have been today, who was, you know, who who died, but that we are, you know, not only able with appropriate treatment and therapy to support children all the way into adulthood, but that we are also, you know, whether for people who were born with HIV or people who've acquired HIV more recently, able to prevent HIV from infecting um, their babies if, if they have the appropriate therapy and prevention. Right. So. That's such a great story um, and a success that way. Would anyone else like to, to share a story? And I mentioned somebody. Um, this is a patient uh, who died two months ago, who I was very close to for 20 years. And mm -hmm. although sad, I find his story very inspiring. He was mm -hmm. um, died at the age of 59. He uh, had been shot in the spine when he was 20. So he was paraplegic for most of his adult life. He also had Hodgkin's disease in his 20s, from which he recovered, and then he developed HIV. Um, so he had a, a lot of medical problems, eventually also added to that insulin requiring diabetes. He was an amazing human being. He would come uh, with a smile on his face and a great sense of uh, involvement in his care, knowledge about his care. He lived by himself uh, for all of those years. And then finally, over the last few months, he developed renal failure. So um, he and I had reached an understanding that he would try dialysis for a few months. And if he wasn't getting any better, he was gonna opt for palliative care. He did, and he died at home, which was his wish two months ago. 
I have never been as strong as a person as this individual was. I could not imagine coping with what he coped with for so many years. Uh, HIV, in a sense, was one of the least of his problems at the end because he was always well controlled. But even then, as Roberto said, he started on treatment in the 90s when regimens were complicated. And he wanted to adhere to those regimens, which had worked well into the 2000s, finally was convinced to take simpler regimens, and they also worked. But he was very devoted to his treatment. He was very devoted to his caregivers. And I honestly don't know how to do it. So I want to how he did it. So I want to just say this out of great admiration and respect for him. I think his choice to um, move to hospice care was perfectly understandable, although I tried my best to convince him not to. Uh, so that's the patient I wanted to mention today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry for for the loss, but that is that is a, a story to carry along as well. And I'm glad we can honor his story today too. Thank you. I, I think the, the patient that comes to mind is, is um, not necessarily a success story, is a, is a current patient of mine um, who has um, probably a lot of mental health issues and struggles and struggles with adherence and struggles with coming in. And I actually consulted uh, Dr. Posada about this patient because his most recent um, issue was just the sight of a pill made him feel ill. And so he wanted to switch to all liquid forms, which um, talk about complicating regimen um, was very difficult. And we've been back and forth. And, and, and I think for me, what the, the story was, was, um, and, and I think really should be highlighted on this day, is so much progress has been made, right? We're down to one pill once a day and they're not very big, which is remarkable um, from obviously when we all started. But I still think ongoing work needs to be done with alternative modalities so that, you know, I am, I am hoping that this young man will benefit from say, you know, the injectables that are, that are in the pipeline. Um, and, and I'm hoping that, you know, there are other modalities that will continue to be, to be created and worked on so that for those people who do struggle with pills or a daily medicine, which, you know, is, is, you know, as you can imagine for a teenager is, can be so difficult, um, that, um, I, I think, you know, he, he reminds me that there is so much work to be done still, um, and, you know, he, struggles to come in, he struggles for many other things. Um, uh, but, you know, I am impressed by him. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I just I hope I, I think of his story as, as a as a caution, cautionary tale that we, we can't just decide that we're done. Uh, there's still work to be done in this field. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and, you know, I completely agree with you too. I mean, we're as, as far as we have come, this, this epidemic is not over and we can't, you know, even in the face of new challenges and our successes, we can't forget that, you know, it's as, as thrilled as I've been, you know, hearing the, the news that keeps coming out about data related to the, the COVID vaccine options and things that are coming forward. And of course, and I, you know, and I of course know that there are different kinds of viruses and so on, but like, of course, I keep thinking like, we, like, will we ever have a vaccine like for HIV, you know, for, for so many years, scientists have been have been struggling to to bring that forward and as you know thrilled as completely thrilled that I as I am about the the rapid advances that have led us you know in less than a year get to a point where there are novel vaccine options um, again, recognizing there are lots of challenges and different kinds of viruses and so on, but still, like we we need a vaccine. And and just as you're mentioning too, you know, for youth especially, I think that the issues of our ongoing needs for different kinds of formulations, different types of medicines that they can that they can take, and you know, among our adolescents in Kenya too, they they ask me all the time when they're going to have you know something else. This idea of injectable medicines that would for a long time something 
like the depot shots that they can take, you know, where you get a shot and it lasts for three months or even lasts for a few weeks and you don't have to take those pills every single day. They're, they're begging for that. And they keep, you know, asking when, when might that come? And, you know, thankfully that's something we do see on the horizon, but then there is the gap between when that science comes forward, when it becomes available for older adults, when it becomes available for our younger adolescents, then when we're able to, to move that to places that have fewer resources as well and to really make it um, you know, equitable access for, for that. I would like, this is a bit of a pivot, but as we think about equitable access and issues of, of justice, of, of equity, and, and also too of, overlapping or intersecting pandemics. And we've talked a lot about how the HIV pandemic and the COVID pandemic intersect in these ways. I did want to talk specifically about a different kind of pandemic. I mean, I use that that term, but which would really be the the impact of systemic racism on the on the issues of of HIV um, for the patient populations we're we're thinking about. And again, I know there, you know, there are a lot of challenges obviously we've been bringing up, but I do think it's really important that we name these issues and we draw attention to them where we where we can. And when we look at our current data as to where are we today on World AIDS Day in terms of HIV, you know, it's still as we look at HIV transmission rates, when we look at treatment outcomes, we absolutely see disparities related to this, this racism. And I wondered if if any of you, um, you know, might be able to share a little bit about how you've seen or know that um, systemic racism is playing a role in the disproportionate burden of HIV within our racial minority communities or within populations you're you're seeing in terms of how how that plays out or how you know these multiple burdens of of um, of pandemics of 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 challenges to struggle against are making it more difficult to move towards the end of these these epidemics as well. Lucy, Dr. So if I could oh, say, I think um, the, the patients that I mentioned, the ones who come in very very advanced with HIV, are essentially all minority patients, particularly African American. Uh, Caribbean patients. And, you know, it's so obvious when you look at that distribution that um, being a minority patient for a host of reasons is um, a very, very difficult challenge. Uh, the housing opportunities, the job opportunities, the ability to stay at home and avoid COVID, uh, you know, uh, even the continuity and care for HIV, every single one of those things is a particular challenge for many people are in, in these racial and ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, that's gotten a little bit better over many years of HIV, but to a greater extent, it hasn't gotten any better. Uh, and we still do struggle with it. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, we have this high rate of viral suppression in our clinic, but we have very few patients who started out as homeless minority patients who ended up in that group or fully suppressed now many years later living successfully. There still is housing discrimination uh, against HIV patients, and there certainly is housing discrimination against minority patients. And in a community like ours, where uh, we have all of this tremendous degree of ethnic diversity, the populations that are poorest, that live in the most crowded living conditions, are invariably minority, particularly African American and uh, Latin American. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I agree with what Dr. Massey said that it's also reflective of our patient population. I think there are also issues related to the healthcare system and healthcare delivery. Um, I think Dr. Massey mentioned before that we're lucky that we're in New York because um, we are better than other parts of, of the country in that sense. Uh, but there's still striking differences in the ability of patients um, to access uh, specialized medical care, for example, mm -hmm. uh, if being much, much more difficult and much longer wait times uh, for patients that are from minority populations or who live in, in poverty who don't have commercial insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and that really impacts uh, the health care that we're able to provide to the patients. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more that that you know our our country really has and our own medical system has a sort of a two tiered system, and so for for you know it's great that we can get ADAP um, fairly easily for anybody with uh, HIV, but should they need something beyond that for health? Uh, that becomes a struggle and the wait times for various, you know, clinics and programs within Mount Sinai and, and across, you know, the New York City are really not, not, not cool. Um, I mean, it really does put people at risk. Um, you know, I, I think if somebody ever decided to put more barriers in front of ADAP, um, we would have a whole generation of people who just decide it's not worth it. Um, and, and, and that's, that is um, sort of unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, so, so poverty is, is horrible. I mean, and it takes a, a, one, a, you know, another patient story. I had a young man who, you know, was gay and Latino and, you know, sort of out to his family, but not really. Um, and this was that, that classic story of, you know, 10 people in a two bedroom apartment he had no private space and he got HIV and we put him on, I think at the time, Rayataz and, and something else, you know, so his eyes turned yellow. So he had to deal with kind of, you know, talking to his family about like, why is that happening? But then he didn't tell me he had HIV. And so here he is, his only private space is a backpack where he kept his, he kept his pills. And the fact that he could be undetectable with that, I thought, well, you know, that's amazing. And I was impressed. And, and I, you know, and again, it's one of those, like his strength of character was incredible to be able to do that. But not everybody can do that. And I, I think, you know, we have to be very, you know, we have to make this stuff so much as easy as possible. Otherwise, we will run up against limiting factors. Um, so, you know, poverty is huge. Housing is huge. Food is huge. Jobs is huge. I mean, it, so many of my kids and by kids, I mean, you know, 18 to 24, these are not children's children. I mean, if they had jobs where they could do something with their day, you know, we'd have less substance abuse. Um, but I, many of them are bored. Um, and, you know, drinking and alcohol, um, you know, in and of itself is not necessarily horrible, but it does tend to make you forget to take your pills, which is bad. So um, I, you can see how there are many intersections of these things that um, I think we struggle with. So and we take it, mind. we take it a step before your patients, uh, before they're looking for a job, then they are in an education system that is really broken. Um, yeah. uh, it's an education system that really does a disfavor to children from uh, who live in poverty, uh, children from minority populations. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I think you're, what all of you are saying is, is so absolutely true in terms of the ways that these, these deep intersecting um, issues of of, of discrimination of our very broken systems or, or systems that are essentially working how they were set up to work, but that are, are racist in their structure or you know do and do perpetuate injustice in their structures as well are are so devastating for our kids lives um especially but i i use kids in the same way john i was struck by that that i'm always saying like yeah my kids are kids and i mean actually like young adults who, oh. who are are in fact that i'm delighted to think of as my kids but are in fact young adults um too you know, I guess maybe shifting gears um, a little bit, I would love to uh, kind of return to the question of, or the topic of vaccines for a moment with all of you. I'm curious um, what, if anything, you're hearing from, from your, your patients right now about vaccines, both as they hear about the COVID vaccine, as they think about HIV vaccines, you know, what, what they're, what they're concerned about, what they're excited about, are they talking about it at all, or is it just you know totally outside the scope of what they're they're considering? Uh, yes. I mean, so I think many of our patients are sort of up to speed on what's happening with uh, vaccines, surprisingly so, for COVID. Um, 
because they are very concerned about it. Sure. I think there's practically universal uh, giving up in terms of an HIV vaccine um, for many years now. Yeah. But the COVID vaccine and the other forms of um, immunomodulatory <laughs> treatment, uh, I think we will have HIV patients um, eager to participate. Now, unfortunately, not many of them have been included in clinical trials nationally. So we don't know exactly what to expect. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that won't be an impediment because they do represent a very motivated and possibly increasingly vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. John, were you going to say something as well? Oh, I just, you know, I, with teenagers and with uh, mm -hmm. you know, young adults, there is always um, a little bit of tension between autonomy and, um, you know, like sort of strong arming what, what mm -hmm. we know is the best science and best evidence. And so somebody without HIV, if they, you know, don't want a flu shot and, you know, and I spend my like, let's, you know, talk about it for a second. You know, if that's, that's their decision, that's their decision. Uh, to be honest with the HIV kids, I am much more of a strong man, um, you know, and, and, and because I know it will help them and help keep them healthy, I'm a bit more of a strong man. I haven't, I still get pushback. I mean, amazingly, I get pushback um, uh, about the flu shot I am sure that I will get pushed back about the COVID-19 vaccine when it comes out, but I have to admit, I'm, you know, just going to be probably keep doing what I'm doing now, which is a little bit of the strong arm um, because it's, it's important. And in this case, autonomy is, is important, but you know, keeping them healthy and their families healthy, you know, for the reasons that people talk about, right. They live in, crowded houses, um, uh, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens when it comes out, but I'm really hoping to be able to, to push it and, and get all my kids up, uh, up on that. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm being cautiously optimistic. <laughs> I think, uh, as Joe mentioned, I think uh, people are really, I've been waiting for a COVID vaccine. Uh, I mean, the impact of this pandemic has been tremendous and people are really looking for a way out and the vaccine may represent that. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, we have a big problem in this country with vaccine hesitancy. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting how the virus a little, and there's a lot of misinformation regarding vaccines. Um, and it's interesting how that affects more vaccine, some vaccines more than others. Uh, like flu vaccine is a common one that people may refuse. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been issues around the Gardasil vaccine or not vaccine, but not all the vaccines. So I'm curious to see how this plays out with the, with the COVID vaccine. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it is interesting because I, I hear it sort of, you know, of course, as pediatricians, we're accustomed to answering lots of questions about vaccines and with people who are hesitant to have their, their especially with parents who are hesitant to have children take them and the concerns. And I do have this sense that, well, there certainly, of course, may be concerns ab about this, you know, whether those are the same set of concerns seems unlikely. Like there's a different set of concerns people are raising, at least from what I've heard so far about the, the COVID vaccine, which, which I think will be interesting to see. In fact, some um, faculty from our combined group and the Department of Global Health at Mount Sinai and Arnold Institute and with the, the group at Elmhurst have been um, doing work to roll out a survey of healthcare providers as, as well to assess and among healthcare workers, you know, are, what are, you know, are you <laughs> essentially like, are you excited about this sex? Are you willing to take a vaccine? Would you do it if you were kind of forced into what are your concerns? Um, you know, just knowing too that that as providers, of course, how I mean, just as John was talking about, like what we do to convince youth to to get vaccines even under normal circumstances. You know how you have that 
talk with a youth probably is, is a big part of what shapes their decision making about it. And so with this brand new vaccine and this brand new virus, of course, how do we have those talks? How do we think healthcare providers are going to want to have those talks when perhaps some of them have questions, you know, too, for themselves about it? Or, you know, others are, are maybe much more eager. We have to, it'll be interesting to see the survey from what people think about that and where people where people are broadly with with that in that way. Well, I know I'm mindful of our, our time together. So I wanted to kind of end this collective time. And again, I really thank you for your time and thank you to everyone who's joined us for, for spending this time and honoring World AIDS Day in this way. I wanted to end looking towards the, the future. And you know, I know especially as we work with with older children, with adolescents, with, with young adults, and, and we think towards those adults who are, are living more often, where there are, you know, there can be, of course, so many challenges. The reason I love working with teenagers is that they are so beautiful and brave in the midst of, of all of this, that they are, you know, bringing that, that energy and their stories to looking towards the future, that even when they're losing their you know, friends to HIV and struggling through so many challenges in their homes and in their social circumstances that they're still you know, willing to, to take chances and to love and to try to move forward. Sometimes it makes me a little crazy when they're risky ones, but that they, they still have that incredible you know, courage and energy that they're, they're bringing to the future. So as we think you know, as a number of, you know, as a group of physicians who, who do care for, for people living with HIV, what's giving you hope about how the stories will be different for people who are living with HIV um, as we look to our next generations? What's, what's giving you hope as we kind of move forward into the next 10 years of, of this, this epidemic? Who wants to start? Dr. Posada, do you want to start? Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think over the last, um, you know, really couple of decades, we've seen, you know, incremental um, developments um, in tools for both um, an armamentarium to treat HIV and also to prevent HIV. And it, I think um, each of those uh, incremental developments may seem like a a small improvement, but put all together, I think we have a pretty significant parameterium of how we can use medications uh, in a much simpler way now than what it was just a decade ago to maintain patients uh, suppressed. So it's much easier for patients to adhere to those regimens. And we have medications to, we have ways to prevent HIV infection. We're very successful if that medications are available in preventing mother to infant transmission of HIV. And that is uh, close to zero in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very successful if patients are, patients who have HIV, uh, if they are suppressed, their chances of transmitting HIV to their partners is close to zero as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know as well that PrEP is, is highly effective. So that gives me um, a lot of hope for the future. I think I'm looking forward to what was mentioned before, uh, medications that are uh, even easier to, to administer, maybe long acting injectables that hopefully will be available for patients in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a, a vaccine as, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Thanks, Roberto. Dr. Stever, what, what's giving you hope as you look forward? Um, I actually was thinking about this the other day that this national conversation that we're having right now around Black Lives Matter um, and, and all the attendant discussion about structural racism and uh, poverty and, school, and schools and jobs and you know, all these things, um, ha just having this conversation is I think shedding light into a dark part of our society world that if we can do that, mm -hmm. um, I think that reducing that, which will then reduce stigma, which reduces you know, reluctance 
and I think we'll improve adherence, um, we'll improve testing, we'll improve, you know, people wanting to be on prep. Um, mm-hmm. I, those are the things that 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 give me hope. Um, I mean, along with new meds and new modalities, but I mean, just having some conversation about some root cause stuff, which I get will take probably decades to start to move the needle, which is depressing, but but at least we're having these conversations now, whereas I don't think we did, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago. So that that's that's giving me some hope. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Massey, as you look to the next 10 years ahead, what what gives you hope for people living with HIV? Well, you know, certainly in this country and in Western Europe, where PrEP has taken hold, um, PrEP is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, prevention of maternal to child transmission has been incredibly effective. And, you know, that's obviously a big step in the right direction. I think, um, unfortunately, COVID has uh, thrown a major curveball uh, into mm-hmm. HIV care all over the world. I think there's something like 75 countries that don't have adequate supplies of any retroviral drugs because of COVID now. Um, so it's, it's hard to see the, uh, the curtain really lifting around the world anytime soon on HIV. But I think the development of um, long half-life medications, injectables that can last months, et cetera, I, I think as that gradually de- gets developed and moves into the developing world, that would be a major um, step in the right direction. So I think, you know, it's like two steps backward, one step forward, one step forward, two steps back, whenever. And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, COVID is going to so distract from HIV. It's one of the reasons I'm so glad we're doing this today, because there are far more deaths from HIV every year than COVID has caused. Uh, I think the extent that that distraction continues, mm-hmm. it's really going to work to the detriment of HIV care. But in this country, and particularly in this part of this country, all these steps have really led to reduction in transmission by all routes and uh, earlier presentation into care, um, maintenance of uh, high CD4 counts, uh, starting treatment very early. All these strategies have been great uh, and they've led to this amazing uh, improvement in survival. But we have to see how that all shakes out around the world and particularly in Africa now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much to all three of you for joining us and and for really um, highlighting more of the stories and the situation for what it looks like for people and especially young people living with HIV in New York as well. And I appreciate your your um, your work in how this looks around around the world as well.